Just a little bit of background information on serial killer Paul Charles Denyer. He was born on April 14th, 1972, in Sydney, in fact. Um, I believe the family moved around. Eventually they moved to Melbourne circa 1981. Uh, in his youth, in his childhood, adolescence, Denyer exhibited uh, all the signs of, of a serial killer to be. Um, for example, he uh, slashed the throat of his sister's teddy bear. I believe he um, uh, killed the family cat. As he moved into his teenage years, there was more uh, antisocial behaviour, um, such as I, I believe he stole a car, um, and there was an assault on a fellow student at school. As he graduated uh, toward his uh, late teens, 20s, he and left school at some point. He struggled to hold jobs. I believe he held multiple jobs for short periods of time. And things began to escalate in um, 1993, in February 1993, which would make him 20 years old at the time, yeah, just short of his 21st birthday, when he began, as he later described, stalking women in the Frankston area. And he zeroed in on a particular woman a young woman named Donna Vaines, I believe her name was, and began to terrorise her with uh, anonymous phone calls until one night when the woman was out, um, I believe with her boyfriend, partner, husband, Daniel actually broke into her unit in Seaford and uh, brutally murdered the family cat, mutilated it. I believe he also killed two kittens. Um, and... Um, he wrote a death threat on the wall, something like, uh, Donna, you're dead, or something, or words to that effect, and strangely, and when placed a uh, pornographic imagery of, you know, pornographic magazine cutouts on the walls. So this was the lead-up to Denya's murders, which, of course, began in mid-1993. At the time of the murders... He lived at 186 Frankston Dandenong Road and it was here where Denya was later first spoken to by police. I am at 186 Frankston Dandenong Road in Seaford. In these block of units at the time of the murders in July, June 1993 lived Paul Charles Denya. When he committed his three murders, Daniel was living in this block of units. Now, unfortunately, there's four units, and I could not find the exact number of the of the unit Daniel lived in. Only that he lived in one of these. But let's go and have a quick gander. So one of those units was Denya's. This is where he lived. In these block of units on 186 Frankston Dandenong Road, Seaford. A former home of Paul Charles Denya. Denya's first victim was 18-year-old Elizabeth Stevens, whom he murdered on the night of Friday, June 11th, 1993. It was a cold and wet night. Elizabeth had been uh, studying at the Frankston Library when she caught a bus home to Cranbourne Road, which led into Patterson Avenue, where she was staying with her aunt and uncle. Um, as she walked along Patterson Avenue, uh, Denya had obviously seen her get off the bus followed her and at some point along Patterson Avenue accosted her. He claimed to have a gun, I believe it was a fake pistol, um, or 
just some piece of wood carved out to, to try to present itself as a pistol. I believe they dragged her into someone's front garden. It was a very wet night. There was, um, even with people, there were some people in the vicinity, but because of the poor conditions, no one paid attention to anything. So then you dragged her into, a, I believe, someone's garden and then told her that if she resisted, he would shoot her or worse to that effect and then marched her to the nearby Lloyd Reserve, uh, took her into some scrub and then brutally attacked her. First he began strangling her, then he stabbed at her throat. Um, she fell to the ground, uh, dying. I believe at some point then you even... Uh, smashed his boot down onto her face. By this point, uh, she was dead, but it didn't stop there. Then you then continued a post-mortem mutilation. Um, he slashed at her, her chest down to her stomach. He made four cuts into her torso and then finished off by plunging the knife six times into her chest. That was the murder of Elizabeth Stevens. Standing on the corner of Patterson Avenue, Cranbourne Road in Langwarren. Denya's first victim was 18 year old Elizabeth Stevens, who was murdered on Friday night, June the 11th, 1993. Now Elizabeth got off a bus and there's a bus stop ooh, not more than 50 meters from here which may have been the one she disembarked from walked down this road and here into Patterson Avenue where she lived at the time Elizabeth was studying I believe at TAFE in Frankston and she was staying with her aunt and uncle here in Patterson Avenue and somewhere along this road Paul Denya struck now I, I'm not sure what house Elizabeth was staying in or of course exactly where Denya accosted her but he but she was murdered and her body found in Lloyd Park Reserve which is at the end of this road there's a bit of a walk and apparently Denya forced her either at knife point or I think he used a fake pistol and forced her to walk to the park so you have to assume it wouldn't have been that far I believe it was a very wet night um, and that type of activity might not have been observed but somewhere along here on Patterson Avenue Elizabeth Stevens was abducted by Paul Denyer I'm at the very end of Patterson's Avenue in what enters into the reserve area and was this the way Denya forced Elizabeth Stevens into? It's a very long stretch of road Patterson Avenue um, and Denya did say he saw her get off the bus on Cranbourne Road so uh, it, doesn't, it, it seems a long way he would have walked her but I don't know he could have come in this way there is an alternative route, we'll look at it in a minute, a shorter route, but Elizabeth's body was found in a sort of bushy scrubland area similar to this. So this may have been Lloyd Park Reserve is the oval is just where you're looking now. I suppose anywhere in this vicinity was Elizabeth Stevens taken and murdered by Paul Denyer. Exact location, I'm not sure. Conversely, Denyer could have led Elizabeth in through this entrance to Lloyd Park Reserve. And there's the oval over there. And obviously, Elizabeth's body wasn't found in that location, but it's a, it's, a, it's a large reserve and there are lots of areas, scrub areas that could have happened so, but it definitely happened in, in this area and Elizabeth 
was abducted on Patterson Avenue and perhaps marched in this way. This road leads off to Patterson Avenue into Lloyd Park Reserve. Here on Seaford Station in Seaford on the night of or evening of Thursday, July the 8th, 1993. 41 year old Rosa Toth disembarked from a train here at this station at approximately 5.50 p.m. And she began walking further down to Railway Parade. Rosa Toth was walking along Railway Parade here which is in front of the Seaford North Reserve walking in this direction here on Railway Parade in Seaford and coming up is a toilet block and it was uh, from this toilet block that Paul Denyer emerged That is the toilet block right there that then you emerge from and attacked Rosa Toth. In this vicinity here. He attempted to drag her into this area but she fought off and managed to flee she was definitely the lucky one so unable to claim a victim with Rosa Toth Denier instead attacked later that night, striking at Debbie Freem. So this is the scene where Rosa Toth was attacked but escaped on Railway Parade in Seaford. Denya's second victim was 22-year-old Debbie Freem, who was abducted and murdered on Thursday evening, July the 8th, 1993. Uh, on that particular Thursday afternoon evening, she was at home in Cannonock Avenue in Seaford, and uh, where she lived with her partner, a man named Gary Blair, who was working the afternoon shift from wouldn't be at at home that evening and Debbie invited one of her friends over, a man named Russell Hayes, for a dinner and he arrived uh, late afternoon and they sat down to have dinner and Debbie was in the process of cooking and at some point in the evening she realized that she was uh, needing milk for the omelette. She had a 12 day old baby son named Jake at home with her. She said she would just duck down to the local shops and buy some milk. So she left uh, Russell Hayes looking after her child, shouldn't have been gone more than 10 minutes, and she drove down to the local milk bar. It was there that uh, Paul Denya struck. When Debbie went into the milk bar, uh, Denya slipped into the back seat of her car. When she returned, he abducted her and uh, drove her to a place called Taylor's Road in Carrum Downs on the outskirts of of the area. She was reported missing and was missing for four days. Amazingly, the next day, her abandoned car was found on uh, Madden Street, 
why a police detective, would you believe, just happened to be driving back to the police station when he spotted her car parked there. Uh, there was um, no sign of Debbie, but there was some traces of blood found around the car. But it wasn't until Monday, July the 12th, 1993, four days after Debbie went missing, that her body was found by a farmer named Fred Micklemore by the side of his paddock on Taylor's Road. Um, Debbie had suffered the similar injuries to Elizabeth Stevens. She'd been strangled. She'd also been stabbed repeatedly in the, in the throat and the chest area. I'm standing on the corner of McCulloch Avenue and Cannonock Avenue in Seaford at the location of the abduction of 22-year-old Debbie Freem on Thursday night, July the 8th, 1993. That Thursday night, Debbie was at home with a friend and her newborn child when she needed to get it, go out and buy some milk. She left her friend at home with her newborn and she drove here to the Cannonock Corner Store here on McCulloch Avenue. She parked her vehicle in this location here in front of the store. She walked a short distance from the car to the store and while she was in the store unbeknownst to her Paul Denyer who was somewhere in this location observing got into her unlocked car and into the back seat <coughs> and waited. Debbie emerged from the store got back into her car started the engine and Denyer struck producing a knife or one of his, perhaps his fake pistol and forcing Debbie to drive in the, but in the struggle initially Debbie's car attempted to do a U-turn in this location here but in doing so the car momentarily lost control and crashed into this wall here I believe this is the wall right here just next to the corner store um, somewhere the front bonnet hit in this location here could very well be the the same brick wall so after smashing into there um, Denya I believe at the wheel by now or perhaps Debbie was still at the wheel but he forced her to drive off Denya drove Debbie to a secluded area um, on Taylor's Road at Carrum Downs where she was murdered and her body dumped but this is the scene of her abduction so Debbie would have so I said she would have parked her vehicle right over there got out walked into the corner store come back out where Denya waited and Denya struck here on McCulloch Avenue in Seaford I'm in Madam Street Seaford in this location, Paul Denyer abandoned Debbie Freem's car on the night of Thursday, July 8, 1993. After abducting Debbie, driving her to Taylor's Road, Karen Downs, where he murdered her, of course he had to dispose of her vehicle, and he chose, randomly, Madden Street here. And he parked a car in that general vicinity there, and then walked away but amazingly he did return now we're not that far from we're about just over a kilometer from where Denya lived at 186 Frankston Dandenong Road but he did return here I think the next day and retrieve some items that Debbie had 
uh, her shopping as well as um, maybe her person etc and he did that in broad daylight where he was observed by several people and uh, which just exemplifies the disorganized nature of Paul Denyer as a serial killer but this was the general location where he dumped Debbie Freem's vehicle Denya's final victim was 17-year-old Natalie Russell, who was murdered on Friday afternoon, July 30th, 1993. On that day, uh, Natalie had been driven to school. Uh, she lived not that far from her school, John Paul College. But it, because of the weather, and it had been raining, uh, I believe her mum drove her to school, which meant that Natalie instead of riding a bike home, would have to walk home. She left school about 2.30pm uh, onto nearby Sky Road and then into the bike track that uh, bisected the golf course, which led to her uh, residential area. Denya was obviously waiting in, in that area. He'd cut a hole in the wire fence and where he dragged Natalie in. Uh, the murder of Natalie was both brutal and but also Natalie put up a, a fierce fight. Um, Natalie had sustained a, a cut to her face, her throat had been cut, um, there was a lot of defensive wounds also to her hands indicating of, of a struggle. Uh, also in the struggle, Denya had obviously cut himself as a portion of Denya's finger skin was actually found on Natalie's body, which would prove crucial. Well, in the end, Denya confessed, but um, it would have been certainly, if he hadn't confessed, that certainly would have nailed him. Also, uh, strands of, of Denya's hair were found in Natalie's hands, so Natalie had put up uh, a great fight, but Denya was a very large man and eventually overwhelmed her tragically. This is John Paul College on McManus Road in Frankston. On the afternoon of Friday, July the 30th, 1993, 17-year-old Natalie Russell left this school and began walking home. Natalie lived on 56 Forest Drive, Frankston North. To get home, she had to traverse a long and desolate bike track. Tragically, Natalie never made it home, but she would have left this school, walked along McManus until she came upon Sky Road at the far end, turned right until she came across the bike track. Friday afternoon, July 30th, 1993. I'm on Sky Road, heading toward the bike track where Natalie walked on that Friday afternoon July 30th 1993 the bike track is a long path that bisects one side's a golf course not sure what's on the other side but of course the bike track is now named in Natalie's honour has been renamed Nat's Track and there is a beautiful tribute to Natalie at the very beginning here of the track. That is the old bike track now Nat's Track as you can see. Such a beautiful touch. And over here we have another memorial to Natalie. This is beautiful. This is this brought a tear to my eye. It is a backpack. Like a bronze sculpture. And there are 17 flowers there, I believe. Representing one for each year of Natalie's life. If I get down, we can read the, the little plaque. Flowers for Nat, daisies, 
17 daisies on a backpack. Truly beautiful. And just a bit further to the right is a bench, also for Natalie. Nat's track. That is truly poignant. I don't think I've ever seen a, a victim of crime on it so beautifully as here, but this is the track. And let's go down the track to Nat's track. If you get to the entrance here, there's a, another sign for Nat. Don't think this was here in 1993, but so this is the beginning of the track. As I said, it's quite a long distance to the spot where Natalie was brutally attacked. Let's go for a walk. I must admit that my interest in the Denya murders stems from the brutal murder of Natalie Russell. When her murder occurred at the end of July 1993, I was living as I've always done in Adelaide. I was 16 years old. And when I just remember hearing on the news about Natalie's murder down this track and they showed the, the picture of Natalie and, I don't know, for whatever reason, that, the, I guess the random nature of it, the brutality of it, the fact that it happened in broad daylight, I'm not sure exactly what, but it's always stayed with me. Just this haunting image of Natalie walking down this very bike track that we're now on. On that bit, I think she used to ride her bike home from the college down this track but on that particular Friday um, she decided to walk I think because of the weather being winter it was wet and, and rainy I, I, I do believe I'm not exactly sure the reason she didn't ride a bike but she decided to walk home now whether that would have made a difference or not whether Denya would have attacked if she was on her bike, I'm not sure. Perhaps not, who knows. Natalie's home is not that far from the end of this track. She lived at 56 Forest Drive in Frankston North. Now we're coming up to uh, what we call like a hill, a ridge. Now Paul Denyer had already come down here some time before and he cut a hole in the fencing to lay in wait for any potential victim. And he described how as he lay in wait he saw a person emerging over this ridge which was Natalie of course. He then disappeared back into the hole in the fence and into the scrub. As you can see, there's a golf course to the left of me. And I see golfers walking around. But yes, as he, uh, and then he went back into the scrub and waited. For Natalie to walk past. So we're coming up to that ridge now. It says the further we get down it's quite isolated and lonely. And of course the problem with this track is there's nowhere to go. We're about halfway between Sky Road and the opposite end. 
fencing on both sides, which was you know, simply could not climb it. So if one became in danger down here, there was just really nowhere to go. I see that these days they've installed CCTV cameras. So okay, we'll say Natalie come up over this ridge. And back and show you that's a fair distance I've just walked to from Sky Road so we're just about in the middle of this track and as Natalie emerged over this ridge Denya spotted her he must have been standing out on the track waiting to see someone emerge and then Uh, duck back into the fence. Now whether Natalie spotted him or not, who knows, she may have. But she didn't stop or turn around, just kept walking. And we're coming up to the spot where Natalie was attacked. And once again, there's, a, there's another beautiful memorial for Natalie at the very spot where Genya struck. It's just so beautiful to see Natalie's memory enshrined in such a way, both at the beginning of her, of her track and also at the spot she was so cruelly attacked. And it's a bit further on up here, I think. So now I'm walking down the ridge a bit. Here golfers off in the distance. And if we just pound back again, you can see that ridge, I guess that's what Denya meant when he saw Natalie emerge from over that ridge. And he waited. He waited for Natalie to pass. And still a bit further on. In fact, it's I think it's just coming up here. It is a long walk. There's some Denya who cut a hole in these fences here with a pair of pliers. Yes, I see the spot just up here. So Natalie was walking. Daniel must have been in these bushes in here. Not sure if the bushes were more thicker or further to the fence in those days. But this is the spot where Paul Daniel attacked Natalie. Right here. And Natalie kept walking. And Denya allowed her to pass. And then Denya emerged from the fence and quickly walked up behind Natalie. In his police recordings, he talks about walking on the left side of the path where there was grass, where the middle of the vert was dirt. But as you can see now, it's all gravel and dirt. So Denya reached Natalie some point up here, grabbed her from behind then dragged her back to the hole in the fence into the bushes where he repeatedly stabbed her and that's where it happened here as you can see there's a beautiful little shrine also for Natalie here they've actually installed a fence the fence is locked so I but we'll have a look at this beautiful little shrine for Natalie In loving memory, Natalie Jane Russell. She was born a year before me, about 14 months before me. Some photos of Natalie there. Such a terrible, tragic end. But yeah, as you see, see there's flowers and 
And also I noticed up here there's a sort of a locket. Um, not sure if that was Natalie's or not. It may well have been. Just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Heartbreaking, but beautiful. I urge anyone to come here and, and pay their respects to Natalie. I think that would be the least they could do. But this was the spot. Rest in peace, Natalie. I'm directly across Nat's track on Sky Road. And it was here that Paul Denyer's uh, serial murders came undone. He had parked his car in this vicinity on Sky Road so he could observe the track. I guess he must have went in there and cut the hole. Um, but what exactly, he was sitting in his car in this area parked on Sky Road. Uh, and a postie coming along Sky Road delivering letters observed Denya sitting in his car around here. As she passed him, well, first she noticed that the car had no registration plates and as she passed the car the man which turned out to be Denya began to slump down in the car as if trying to avoid being seen which raised her suspicions that doesn't sound like that much but to, to her eternal credit she thought this was suspicious obviously there'd been two murders in the last two months in this area and she went into a house somewhere along here and reported her suspicions to police a police car rolled up. Um, and, and found Denya's car here. But Denya was not in the car. He was actually in the track. And it may have been after the murder of Natalie. Denya later said as he came out of the track, he saw the police snooping around his car and simply walked off. The police noted Denya, he had a temporary registration tag on the window and of course when Natalie's body was found the next day um, police realised that that car had been seen in this area and traced them back to Paul Denya and that was what undone Paul Denya along with all the forensic evidence and then of course while in police custody after initially Denying the murders, he confessed, putting an end to his uh, barbaric crimes. Just an epilogue to the Paul Denya case. Um, the day after Natalie uh, was murdered and her body was found on July 31st, 1993, Paul Denya was located by police and taken in for, in, for questioning. Um, at first he denied any involvement in any of the murders, um, but as the night wore on, uh, the police requested a uh, blood sample, DNA sample, something like that, and I guess Denya figured the game was up and he then confessed during that long night. Um, because of Denya's confession, there was no need for a trial as such, obviously pleaded guilty to the three murders and I believe the attempted abduction of Rosa Toth on December the 20th 1993 Denya was uh, sentenced to life imprisonment initially without any possibility of parole but he then lodged an appeal against that non-parole uh, period and in July 1994 he won an appeal and a non-parole period of 30 years was set now, which I believe is backdated to the time of the murders, or at least his arrest, so um, that would make it uh, 
non-parole period would come up um, in 2023, which is only next year, next year marking the 30th anniversary of these murders. Um, in around 2003, uh, Denya began to identify as a woman in prison, and I believe he now, or she now, goes by the the name Paula, and I believe he's used that to kind of justifies killing saying he was torn about his gender identity and and uh, wanted to lash out at women but anyway that's a whole other whole other issue that I'm I'm certainly not going to get into but that is the fact and as I record this uh, today's date is May the 2nd 2022 Daniel remains incarcerated in prison in in Victoria um, as I said uh, most likely his uh, a chance of parole will come up uh, next year but there is I believe a petition underway to prevent that from happening but even if it does I, I don't think Daniel will be um, uh, released and well let's certainly hope not so but that has been the the serial killings of Paul Charles Daniel.